Our guest today is the junior United States Senator from Illinois. She is an Iraqi war veteran, a Purple Heart recipient, and City Club member John Atkinson reminded me today, today is National Purple Heart Day. Thank you, John. She's a former Assistant Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs. Our guest today was elected to the United States Senate three years ago after representing Illinois' 8th Congressional District in Congress for two terms. She is a graduate of the University of Hawaii and earned a Master of Arts in International Affairs from Georgetown University. She and her husband, Brian, an Army major, are the proud parents of their two beautiful daughters. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Tammy Duckworth. Your Honor. Hi, everyone. Well, it's great to be back. I ate as fast as I could because I was not going to miss a meal here. Um, but it's great to uh, be back this afternoon, and it's so wonderful to see such so many old friends in the room. And I want to, uh, I'd be remiss if I did not mention Marka Bristol with Access Living, who is here at the uh, table with me. Without her work for the last, without her work for the last 30 years, I could not be a U.S. Senator today because the ADA would not be in existence. Um, but what I want to talk to you today is about what we can do to keep America strong something that I care very deeply about. First though, let me say this. America will never be as strong as she should be as long as we keep letting the places where our loved ones learn or pray or play be turned into war zones. My heart is broken for the 22 people who lost their lives and for their loved ones in El Paso. The nine who were killed in Dayton just hours later I also grieve for the loved ones and those who died from gun violence in Chicago this year, hundreds of them. It is well past time that we honor the lives of those lost, not just with moments of silence, but with real action. And I'm sorry to say that as I was coming up onto the stage, I received a note that there are reports of a shooting occurring right now in Virginia at the USA Today Gannett Building. That is un happening right now. USA Today? Yeah, the Gannett News Building, USA Today Gannett Building in, in um, Virginia. So I'm going to keep doing everything that I can to pass common sense legislation like expanded background checks. It is something that 97% of Americans support, universal background checks. It would help keep weapons of war out of the wrong hands without infringing on anyone's Second Amendment rights. Because no one should kneel in their pew, sit down at their desk, or walk down the street on a Saturday night with the fear that every prayer, every lesson, every step could be their last. We're better than that as a nation, and we can truly do this. You know, nothing about this great nation was inevitable. Nothing our, about our success has been preordained. It took the kind of action that I just spoke of. It took the courage of citizen soldiers who followed Washington across the Delaware, willing to sacrifice everything for an idea, America, and an ideal democracy for the people, by the people. It took the sweat of immigrant laborers who literally connected our nation one railroad at a time, breaking their backs, building the transcontinental railroad. And it took the bravery of those who crisscrossed the underground railroad, risking their lives to guide others towards freedom, making America more American with every step that they took. From the Lincoln-Douglas debates to the World's Fair, Myra Bradwell to Barack Obama, Illinoisans have led the way. They've started businesses, they broke the barriers and set the milestones that have helped make this nation's improbable story possible. But past is not necessarily prologue. The heights that we reach in decades or centuries prior have little bearing on how tall our country will stand in the years to come. Because right now, we are at a precipice. And no matter which way we look, threats abound. China is surging while tensions with Iran spike. 
Russia is bludgeoning its way back into relevance, while our country is fracturing along political and racial lines. Partisan fissures threaten both our economic and national security. You know, I've dedicated my entire adult life to protecting and defending this nation, first as a citizen soldier and now in the United States Senate. Keeping this country the strongest she can possibly be isn't just some vague notion for me. It's an imperative. It is a must. But through the years, through my time in the Army and now in Washington, I've learned that there isn't just one way to keep this nation strong. There are many. Today, I want to focus on two, our infrastructure and our national security. All too often, people assume that investing in infrastructure just means fixing some potholes. They think that investing in our military just means writing a big, bigger check for some more lethal tanks or faster fighter jets, and they are wrong. When done right, bolstering our infrastructure and national security will help our economy to grow and our small businesses to expand, and it will keep our families healthier and our homeland safer. So as we face threats ranging from domestic to international to planetary, investing in infrastructure and national security is in the right way is crucial to maintaining American strength, and with it, our place leading the international order. Whether it's factories or farms, billion dollar corporations or mom and pop shops, America's businesses have always depended on a strong infrastructure network to get their goods and services to market. And as it so often does, Illinois has led the way. We built the nation's first elevated electric rail line back in the 1800s, while O'Hare has been one of America's most important transportation hubs ever since its runway first opened for takeoff more than a half century ago. Those down payments previous generations made on our infrastructure have paid dividends for all of us who are here in this room today. With every bridge fortified and every telephone line hung, they made our country physically and figuratively stronger. It supercharged our economy after World War II. It helped small businesses by keeping the power on, keeping shipping costs down, and keeping tourism revenue up. And helping families stay in touch through easier travel and better broadband also. But the once smooth roads that connect our country have become dilapidated. The once cutting edge grid lines that power our nation are now outdated. Our infrastructure is crumbling, one port, one power grid at a time. So it falls on us to renew those investments that past generations began. If we don't, we won't just be risking a bumpier drive down the interstate. We'll all risk falling behind our global competitors and being unable to compete in the modern economy. That will cost us countless jobs. It would further hurt the farmers and the producers who already have a hard time moving goods to market. And it would hamper our chances of fighting off both the, the climate crisis and an attack on American soil. As your senator, I am so grateful to be in a position to try to do something about it. It is why I asked to serve as ranking member of the Transportation and Safety Subcommittee. And in that role, I've been able to sound the alarm on the dire need to modernize our infrastructure before it is too late. This is not a partisan issue. It's just common sense economic priority and a national security imperative. Already, the sad state of our infrastructure is weighing down our economy. Research shows that we lose $200 billion a year from inefficient rail transportation, and we lost $305 billion in 2017 alone due to traffic congestion. Meanwhile, underinvestments in the sector has cost our nation's 900,000 jobs. So this much is clear. In an era of bitter partisan divides, we have to seize onto the issues that both sides of the aisle can agree to. We should be able to do that here, and I'll keep working across the aisle to hold Trump and his still unkept campaign promises to push forward a comprehensive infrastructure plan. Because every day that we don't take action on infrastructure, we're leaving money on the table for companies that are struggling to get whatever they're selling to market. We're ignoring the families who are having a hard time making ends meet because of the impossible commute to work. We're abandoning rural Americans who don't have adequate access to broadband. Every dollar invested in transportation infrastructure returns threefold in economic impact. Every new project will create countless jobs. And we're not just talking about construction work that is short term. 
but long-term jobs too, operating and maintaining this infrastructure. There are roles in future infrastructure, jobs in terms of water treatment operators to bus drivers to telecom line installers. Good paying work that often doesn't require a college degree with low barriers to entry and wages, sometimes 30% higher than the relevant average. More than 14 million workers hold infrastructure related jobs today. That's roughly 11% of the workforce. Imagine the economic opportunity, the competition, the boom that would come from modernizing everything from our water pipes to our railroads, our broadband to our waterways. Mm -hmm. Imagine how much more quickly, cheaply, reliably companies could sell their products, how many more people could get to work or go to school, and how much time they could save getting there. Imagine how that would grow our economy and cushion it against future economic shocks. So that's what I've been thinking about since the day I took the oath of office, and that's what I focus on in the very first bill I introduced as senator. People assumed it would be a veteran's bill. It was not, but it was involved with a veteran because I partnered with my colleague from Indiana, a Marine veteran, and together we passed a bill that slashed red tape around infrastructure projects to support Illinois jobs and businesses and save taxpayers money, and which set a Senate record for speed by being signed into law just four months after I was sworn in. I know four months doesn't sound like fast, <laughs> but we're talking about Congress here. In Senate time, that is the blink of an eye. It's why I introduce also the TIFIA for Airports Act to give airport projects greater access to cheaper capital financing by being able to access highway trust funds. That's also why last week I set aside $200 million in the highway bill to reduce roadway congestion and introduce other legislation to increase pipeline safety. It's why I've helped secure $160 million in infrastructure grants for Illinois alone including, and I'm very proud of this, $132 million for the 75th Street Corridor Improvement Project that will ease congestion at one of Chicago's worst freight rail bottlenecks. Because this city is the beating heart of our nation's freight supply chain. And if rail shipments across Chicago are not efficient, the entire country suffers. It's also why I've pushed to make our infrastructure greener and more just. In fact, I created the environmental justice with Cory Booker, and we're working on these very issues. All too often, climate, business, and working families are seen as competing interests, and that's just not true. With more wildfires ranging down the coast of California and more storms flooding the Midwest, research shows that every dollar spent on disaster mitigation efforts would save $6 in future costs. So by shifting away from our status quo and building green, resilient infrastructure, we'll be investing in both the environment and our economy. By doubling down on renewable energy sources, we'd be investing in our loved one's health too. Lowering rates of asthma and other diseases linked to pollution that overwhelmingly affects community of color, like the South Side, a fact that led me, as I mentioned, to found the Senate's first ever Environmental Justice Caucus with both Cory Booker and Tom Carper, the ranking member of the Environmental Committee or by replacing our lead, leaden pipes systems. We wouldn't only be promoting sustainability or widening our workforce, but also help prevent something like the Flint crisis from ha ever happening again. After all, how could America be anywhere near its strongest while low income or any of our kids are still getting poisoned just by drinking from their school's water fountains? We don't have forever to take these steps because while Flint it was a tragedy, it was not an anomaly. Today, thousands of communities, including many military communities and other communities here in Illinois, are on the brink of disaster, with lead poisoning rates two times higher than those found during the worst moments of the Flint crisis. Meanwhile, extreme weather-related disasters have already cost the U.S. $1.6 trillion, $1.6 trillion in the last four decades alone. Storms have already ravaged our military bases, and high tides have already flooded our Coast Guard stations, affecting troop readiness and sapping American strength, and proving time after time that not all the biggest threats over the next 50 years will take the shape of a missile. In fact, 100 U.S. military bases are slated to be flooded due to climate change. So climate change isn't some partisan squabble. It's a national and global security threat 
something that military leaders and this administration's own intelligence officials admit. As terrorist groups like ISIS and Boko Haram use drought to solidify their power in Syria and Nigeria. And there are no shades of gray here. We need to take action to curb climate change before it is too late. One way to do that, that I'm working on, is to pivot the military further away from fossil fuel and investing in green energy instead. Even conservatives like former Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis have spent years pushing for this. Not only because it slashed pollutants, not only because it'd be cheaper and help strengthen the fastest growing industry in our country, solar, not even because it reduces our dependence on foreign oil and cuts ties to oil rich bad actors like Saudi Arabia, though it would do all of those things. Even Republicans support doing something because it is proven time and again to save our troops' lives. Don't take my word for it. General Mattis, Secretary Mattis, who all but begged the military to untether itself from fossil fuel, has spoken on this. Why? Well, let me give you an example from my time in Iraq. Fuel supply convoys make for easy, predictable targets. In Afghanistan, for example, in 2007, one of every 24 <coughs> fuel convoys suffered casualties. In Iraq, 50% of all casualties that occurred were as a result of convoy operations, not from kicking down doors looking for insurgents. 80% of all convoys conducted in Iraq were to transport fuel. Even George W. Bush agreed. He set renewable energy benchmarks for our military to reach, benchmark that became more ambitious under President Obama. During President Obama's tenure, the Navy actually conducted an entire naval training exercise operating 100% on biofuel blends. In the years since, we've learned that these policies work. Green energy keeps our troops safer as efficient fuel uses slashes their number of refueling stops. Mobile solar panels enable troops to turn off generators, helping them move through enemy territory unheard and undetected. And low weight, longer lasting batteries lighten troops packs, meaning they can carry more bullets. As one former Navy captain put it, and I quote, years ago the belief was you could either be efficient or capable as a warfighter. Now we found they are interdependent. By being more efficient, you become a better warfighter, end quote. In other words, the dollars we invest in green energy bolster our infrastructure and military, making our economy and families healthier in the process, but also makes our military more efficient. To me, this is just the latest proof point that we risk falling behind our adversaries as long as we keep siloing issues in the ways that we're used to. Instead, if we want America to be at its best, we have to begin taking a more interconnected approach to the challenges we're facing, including rethinking how we view national security, reframing it into something more holistic than just dollars or numbers of missiles. Because while today we have the greatest military on Earth, that may not be true tomorrow if we keep on the path we've been treading. Pentagon spending already accounts for about half of the discretionary federal budget. We pour roughly $700 billion into defense every year. But just funneling money into the DOD is not enough. For too long, we've measured the might of our military by the size of our arsenal. And in doing so, we've made the flawed assumption that our decades of dominance on the global stage can predict our future place in the world. But ISIS does not care that we stormed the beaches of Normandy. Russia isn't giving us points because once upon a time, we outraced them to the moon. China doesn't give a damn what we did during Desert Storm. We will lose ground. Literally and figuratively, if we sit back and assume that last century's tactics will win us the next decade's wars. If we believe that 2030's battles will be decided solely by how much money we spend on fighter jets or ships, we will not win those battles. You know, I come from a long line of veterans who've served this country in uniform since before Washington crossed the Delaware. I will always, always make sure our troops have every dollar, every weapon they need to bring down the bad guys. But we can't just keep throwing together huge defense budgets every year for military equipment and think that that is enough. No, we have to balance investing in our weaponry with investing in our citizenry. Rejecting the false choice between looking out for our troops overseas and caring for our families here at home. It's not either or, it's both and. Our power abroad stems from our strength here on US soil. So it's past time we recognize that funding our domestic priorities actually bolsters our security. 
Because at this point, refusing to invest in things like our schools or our healthcare system in the name of national strength isn't just short-sighted, it is counterproductive. Let me give you an example. For the last couple of years now, the Pentagon has released st statistics, and most recently, that statistic says that only 29% of Americans between ages of 17 and 24 are considered fit to serve. Think about that. Of all the 17 to 24 year olds in this nation, only 29% meet the st Pentagon standards for service. 29%. The other 71% of our young people do not qualify for military service because they don't have the basic education, they can't pass a physical, or a bar from enlisting because they made a mistake years ago that still lies on their record, like one struggling with an opioid addiction. Meanwhile, the Army fell short of its recruiting goals last year for the first time since the peak of the Iraq War. So I'm not pushing for better health care or more funding for our schools just because it's the right thing to do or because I'm some lefty progressive. I'm doing so. I know, it's rarely, I'm rarely called a lefty progressive. Um, <laughs> I'm doing so because I love our country and I want America to remain the toughest nation in the world. And we don't stand a chance of dominating militarily if three quarters of our would-be recruits can't even get to basic training in the first place. I'm doing this because it, just as infrastructure is critical to our national success, our place atop the global order is also contingent on us taking up the domestic policy that all too often is seen as in opposition to our defense priorities. If we don't, well then we are gonna be letting that dwindling recruiting pool of 29% shrink even faster, ceding our place in the world to those bad actors like Russia and China in the process. So what do we need to do? Well, first, we need to tackle the systemic issues that are robbing us of so many would-be recruits. How do we expect to win the wars to come if more and more Americans are too sick or have fallen too far behind in school to enlist? We can't. We will lose our place in the world if we don't do the work today to ensure how many people as possible can wear, as many people as possible can wear the uniforms of tomorrow. That starts with addressing the fact that half of young Americans are considered too unhealthy to serve. Some suffer from diseases like asthma, while 27% are deemed too overweight to enlist. So the recent attempts to strip health care from families aren't just cruel, they are hypocritical. hypocritical. Every time a government makes it harder for an American to get health care, they're sapping the military's potential strength, robbing it of potential privates or second lieutenants, even while claiming we need to spend more money to make our armed forces more powerful. What is the use of spending over $100 million for each F-35 fighter jet if we can't find the people to fly or maintain them. There are fixes here that shouldn't be considered partisan, like making sure every child in every classroom in America has access to mental health care, or guaranteeing that every parent can afford basic checkups for their toddler. Look, the military already pours more than $1.5 billion a year into treating obesity-related medical conditions and actually discharging those who are unhealthy to continue to serve, who've been trained, but are not, now considered too unhealthy to serve, and replacing them with new recruits who have to be trained from scratch. So no one can claim to care about military spending or readiness if they don't support common sense healthcare policies that would actually get our forces into better fighting shape and save us money in the process. It's a similar story when it comes to education. There's something wrong when more than a quarter of potential recruits can't serve because A, they can't do math or e read at the eighth grade level that military manuals are written at, or B, they never earned a high school diploma or GED. A quarter of our young people in this country, let me say it again, cannot enter the military because they cannot read or do math at the eighth grade level. That figure is shocking, but not surprising reflecting the broader reality that half of U.S. adults can't read books at that same middle school level. But here too are the concrete ways to solve the problems. Research has proven that early childhood learning directly affects long-term development, with studies showing that at-risk kids who attend good preschools are 44% more likely to graduate high school. Meanwhile, in 2015, a Pentagon study uncovered $125 billion in bureaucratic waste. 
imagine how many more kids would graduate if we invest some of that, some of that $125 billion in Chicago's public schools instead. And if we don't make these investments, if we keep letting our schools slide and our students suffer, imagine how many would-be Marines or Green Berets or helicopter pilots we would be losing. If we don't start to better invest in our kids, we might lose out on those pilots, brave enough to risk their lives to pull an injured buddy out of their burning helicopter, like the ones who took, carried me to safety. Or perhaps we will miss out on the next eight Navy admiral who could have led the raid to capture the next bin Laden. It's really never been a choice between schools and national security. I don't care who tries to put up that false equivalency. Just as investing in future vertical lift weapons platforms is a much needed investment in our army, so too is investing in the child who could be capable of flying those high-tech helicopters one day. You know, I'm living proof of that. And many of you are living proof of that as well. Because my access to a good public education prepared me for my career in the military. And this November, I'll celebrate the 15th anniversary of my Alive Day. And that's the day an RPG tore through the helicopter. <laughs> that is the day I would have died had my buddies not risked their lives to save me. So from the moment I woke up at Walter Reed more than a week later, I vowed to spend the rest of my life trying to repay the heroism of the troops who saved me. Which brings me to my last point, what we owe to those who are willing to serve. I can't fly combat missions anymore or be the one to drag them to safety if the worst should strike again. But what I can do is use my new role, serving no longer from the pilot seat but from the Senate Armed Services Committee to make sure that Congress does right by our service members. Listen, our troops will always do their job defending our country no matter what. And many of them go back time and again. The least they deserve in return is to know that they've got the moral support and legal backing of this nation. I personally know troops who have deployed nine times. Nine deployments. Imagine that. But for more than 15 years, Washington has failed to give them even that. One of Congress's most solemn duties is deciding when and how we send troops into combat by debating and passing a military, an authorization for use of military force, which are supposed to define the mission of Americans who are downrange. But for too long now, some on the Hill have shrugged off that sacred duty, scared of the political risks, staring down election days. Congress has shirked its responsibility to our troops, refusing to take up any new AUMF to address the wars we're still mired in, or the brewing tension with Iran. And because of that, our troops are left strewn around the world, shadow boxing an ill-defined enemy. Teenagers who weren't even alive when the Twin Towers fell are now old enough to be shipped off to Afghanistan with little idea as to what the end state should look like. Heroes who've done six, seven, eight, as I said, nine deployments, wake up every morning knowing that by week's end, they could be sent back to Iraq or even to Iran as the Trump administration continues to manufacture a crisis that's led us to the brink of disaster. With advisors like John Bolton setting the conditions for war, then having the administration take actions to make those circumstances a reality, placing us on a collision course with life and death stakes and no off-ramp. Enough, enough of Congress being so worried about political consequences that we don't do our jobs, even as we expect our troops to do theirs every damn day. Anyone, anyone who claims the mantle of patriotism, who says they want to keep our country strong, can't keep demanding such sacrifices from our service members while refusing to have this debate. So Congress needs to take a cold, hard look in the mirror, muster up some courage, and reclaim its constitutional responsibility, the most solemn burden of declaring war, actually laying out what we're asking for from our troops. After all, how can we expect Americans to re-enlist or to sign up for the first time if we can't even tell them why we are asking them to sacrifice. If we don't, our already narrowing military population will continue to contract, leaving us with too few people to bear too heavy a burden. You know, I've been talking for a while. There's only like three pages left. <laughs> so let me say this. 
America's strength has always stemmed from our ability to come together and find common ground even when it is hard, especially when it is hard. Our power has always come from America's desire not only to be great, but to be good for ourselves and for each other. But right now we are at a breaking point. And in this moment when our slow pace of investment in both our economic and national security is imperiling our place on the world stage, in this era when tribalism is threatening to overshadow patriotism, it's on each of us to do everything we can to keep not just our states united, but our people too. And that starts with viewing the trials in front of us as a complex, gray-shaded challenge that they are. Because there's no real choice between investing in our economy and investing in our citizenry. There's no real choice between caring for our troops and caring about our classrooms. There's no real choice between loving our country and wanting to make it better. In fact, working to improve America is exactly what has allowed it to be so strong for so long. This nation was founded on the notion of a more perfect union. It was built on the idea that we can always do better, never achieving perfection, but always striving to climb a little higher than the day before. To me, that's true patriotism. And that's how we achieve true, enduring American strength. Thank you. on the podium, so I don't need the chair. You don't want the chair? No, Jack. No, because we have to speak. There's the mic is up here. Right. Thank you, though. Okay. Um, that was wonderful. <clears throat> if I was still a university professor and uh, you were in my seminar, I would say that was a great speech. Now we have to edit it by a few pages so we can have some questions. I have speech writers, but no editors. Well, <laughs> I'll talk to them afterwards. Anyhow, I have a very important announcement, friends. You know that um, Senator Duckworth started our meeting today by talking about an incident in Washington. And I just received from Rick Pearson of the Chicago Tribune over here very good news. It was a false report of a gun oh, at the USA headquarters today. So that's very good. That's good news. OK, we've got so many questions. We'll try to handle as many as we can. There are a number related to um, veterans. Mm -hmm. um, how is the VA doing these days with caring for our vets? Are the services provided sufficient to reach the homeless and addicted vets that can't come in? And what can be done to include 89,000 Illinois veteran-owned businesses in the federally funded state-led procurement process? So, you can address those any way you would like. <laughs> well, so the VA has always been, well, not always, has been, for, I would say for the last 20 years, really some of the best health care in this country. It's where I go for my health care. I have my Senate provided um, health care. Thank you, taxpayers. Um, but I actually turn that over. I turn my insurance card over to VA and I go to Heinz. Um, and I sit in the same waiting room as my fellow vets because I want to see how long those waits are and I call the same frustrating telephone lines. Once you get into the system, the healthcare is really quite excellent. The problem is getting into the door, because most people don't realize that VA is required to ration its care. Um, so you can only get care if you are um, a regular veteran at the VA for those conditions that are connected to your service. The ankle you sprain on a parachute jump, the back you threw out when your Humvee rode over it but you don't get care for the rest of your body, only for the service-connected conditions. If you are 100% service-connected like I am, then you get everything taken care of, including vision and dental. But unless you're 100% service-connected or you took a grenade to the mouth, you don't get vision or dental. Additionally, um, veterans can go to VA if, they're pro if they drop below a certain poverty level. In the Chicagoland area, I think it's around $38,000 a year. Then they can go to VA for care. But everyone else, people assume, can go to VA, and they can't. And so the struggle for veterans is actually getting into the system. And the system is, does not have enough mental health providers, for example. Uh, um, 
so we need to work on that issue. We need to allow veterans to be able to access care outside VA on a very um, structured basis. I do not support privatizing of VA because the VA has certain expertise that the rest of the medical um, community does not have. I'll give you an example. If a gentleman who is in his late 60s goes to his family doctor and is diagnosed with prostate cancer, he will get very good care for that prostate cancer. That would be the end of it. That same 67-year-old person goes into the VA for care. The first thing they will ask is, are you a Vietnam vet? Because prostate cancer is five times more likely among men who were exposed to Agent Orange. They would then immediately at the VA search that person and, 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 and make sure they monitor that person for ischemic heart disease, leukemia B, uh, diabetes, and all of the other conditions that have been shown to be connected to Agent Orange exposure. Once he's diagnosed and he's being monitored at VA, if he wants a prostate cancer taken care of or his diabetes um, taken care of by a private practitioner near his home, we should pay for that. But the VA needs to be that medical center home because they're checking for those conditions. I think for the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, we're going to have significant neurological disorders in the next 20 to 30 years develop, um, as well as respiratory illnesses from uh, the burn pits. And the VA is monitoring that. But if you have someone who just goes to a family doctor and is showing signs of Parkinson's, he may get treated for that. But we're seeing a spike in Parkinson's among veterans who are in their 30s who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and so this is why VA is so incredibly critical. Plus, every VA hospital is actually attached and in partnership with a teaching university. So you have Loyola with Heinz, for example. It makes them on the cutting edge of, res of medical research. So we need to fund VA, uh, but we can do better. As far as getting the uh, veterans-owned businesses into the state um, uh, uh, system, I will talk with the governor on that. I do, will touch on one thing. I'm very proud of a piece of legislation I actually passed uh, for veteran-owned businesses um, that was signed into law during the shutdown. <laughs> Miracles can happen. Uh, it was a standalone bill, and it gives small businesses that are veteran-owned so you need to be certified as a small business by the SBA, and then the VA or your local VA will certify that you are a veteran um, by looking at your discharge paperwork. Complete access to surplus government property for free. So we, the taxpayers, are now paying to warehouse, giant warehouses full of government surplus property. Everything from laptops to furniture to um, uh, kitchen equipment to backhoes, bobcats, pickup trucks, fleet vehicles, they're being housed. Um, eventually they go onto the auction block, people come in with a bunch of money, buy them for cheap and then sell them. Uh, uh, but this allows veterans to go in and get that equipment for their businesses. They're not allowed to turn around and sell that on eBay. They have to keep it and use it for the business. But they can, if you want to start a construction business, you can go find a backhoe. It won't cost you anything to go grab it and put it to use in your business. Um, you can't go get a flamethrower. <laughs> no flamethrowers, no, no, no tactical equipment, so no like, you know, Lawn care by flamethrower businesses allowed. Senator, I hate yeah. to act, act like uh, mm -hmm. no, Moscow McConnell, but we have a very short time. I have a bunch of questions in different areas, and if you could just keep your remarks as edited, edited as possible. <laughs> and this is from Barrett Peterson, the mayor of Franklin Park. Congressman Dan Lipinski is either holding committee hearings or gathering information on chronic train stoppages and blockages that are hindering the flow of commerce and industry in hundreds of towns throughout Illinois and the USA. What can be done to force railroads to reduce blocked grade crossings? Um, and another question relating to rail from uh, J.P. Morgan Private Bank, Maury Bassin. What's happening with high-speed rail in the list of priorities? High-speed rail does not exist uh, for a couple of things. One, we've not made the infrastructure investment, first and foremost. Um, our rail, our, we can get the high-speed rail cars. The problem is our tracks can't support them. So, for example, the track from Chicago down to St. Louis is 120 years old. We would have to upgrade the track. So we need significant infrastructure improvement in order to bring in high-speed rail. Um, this goes back to the Trump administration's priorities. The President Trump has said that he wants infrastructure investment, but yet he's not come up with the money for it. And in fact, the last two budgets that he's proposed, he cut infrastructure funding by $200 billion each year. And bipartisan, 
De Democrats and, and, and Republicans on Transportation Committee have actually put that $200 billion back into the budget, uh, 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 countering the administration's proposed cuts. So we need to put that money into the system. Um, as far as the rail blockages is concerned, I'm working with Administrator Batori of the um, Freight Rail Association to um, uh, work on instilling an on-time performance report as to why a train is late, what caused it, so we can track this. Because that, that data is not being, uh, it's tracked, but it's not being made um, transparent to the public. Okay, great. A um, couple questions here. Um, this is from uh, Nikki Labastian with Crow LLP. Um, as an active constituent who aligns with your policies, how can we, and she's a relatively young person sitting over here, be involved in creating an impact at the federal level beyond voting, <laughs> donating, and volunteering? Speaking up. It's literally speaking up. I've seen, uh, despite the... Um, real log jam, or as we call it, the uh, legislative graveyard in the Senate. Um, we have seen things move when the people speak up, even when you support me. Because if you call my office, you send me an email, you write me a letter, you fax me something. For those who are using fax machines, we have fax machines in the office. Um, uh, uh, um, I track all of those. And then I am allowed to say to the chairman of my committee, I received 400,000 constituent emails across Illinois on this issue. And it is important, so you need to do that. Um, but, but the public sentiment does make a difference. The first time that the majority tried to eliminate the Affordable Care Act, when John McCain famously did his thumb down vote, the reason that we were able to defeat that effort was because, not because of anything that I said to Lisa Murkowski, the senator from Alaska, for example, but it was because of the mom and the dad from two different families with their two kids uh, with significant medical conditions who sat in the vestibule between our offices for three months, changing tracheotomy tubes, doing medical procedures right there, saying to everyone who walked into Senator Murkowski's office for those that entire long hot summer, you take away the Affordable Care Act, my child dies. That's who changed those minds. Same with the Violence Against Women Act. When I was in uh, the House, uh, the Republicans would not support the renewing the Violence Against Re um, Women Act under Speaker Boehner uh, for three reasons. One, they did not want to extend coverage for transgendered uh, individuals because they said, well, they're not really women, so they don't need to be protected under the Violence Against Women Act. They said that um, immigrant women who are undocumented don't have rights to be um, uh, covered, and they didn't want, want to extend coverage to um, Native American women because they feared extending uh, too much control into tribal territory. So they were not going to allow that to come up for a vote. For the first time, it was not going to be renewed. The American people spoke up and shamed them and forced them, and they actually brought it up for a vote, and it passed. We're the same way right now in that same position when it comes to both health care but also election security. I think that Senator McConnell is getting a lot of heat on his attempts to block legislation on election security, and the people are making a difference. And I'm hoping that when we go back, he's going to be forced to allow us to actually vote on it. Okay, we have time for just three questions. Um, Jack Duffy, where are you? Jack? Oh, right in the middle. Right there. He's a high school student. Excellent. He's so concerned about public affairs and that. Um, he wants to know your stance on for-profit prisons. Yeah, I don't support them. <laughs> okay, that answers that. <laughs> we call the firing round. That's edited. By the way, I would like to recognize my congressman. Yes. Congressman Danny Davis. Woohoo! Thanks Thank for coming, you. Danny. Okay, this is about student loans. We have a recent master's graduate from Indiana University, Bloomington, Indiana. He claims to have a six-figure student debt. He wants to know what you foresee student debt looking like in the next five years for both private and public loans? If we don't do something, it will get worse. Already there's more student loan debt held in this country than credit card debt. Um, we need to fix the system. I don't support free college. I support debt-free college. And there's a difference. Uh, I think we should have several things. One, an expanded national service program so that you can earn college money. Uh, by serving this nation, not necessarily in, the, in, in uniform, but I do think that if I could pick up a rifle and earn a GI Bill for four years of service, you should be able to pick up a piece of chalk, a shovel, a soup ladle, and go volunteer in some way 
and say for every 18 months of your service, you earn two years of tuition. That would bring people, young people, it would be voluntary and it would allow young people to actually have some buy-in into our, into, our, into our nation because I think we have fewer and fewer people who serve this country and this would expand that public service aspect. But you could then, for example, do three years of some sort of national service, not necessarily all in one shot, and earn enough to be able to graduate college. Additionally, we need to extend Pell Grant programs. Uh, we need to have more student work study. And I think that you should be able to at least graduate debt-free from a two-year school and working towards debt-free on a four-year institution in this way. Pell Grants, grants, but also work-study so that when you graduate, you're not, you, you don't owe any money, but you didn't also get a handout. You had to work your way through college the way my dad did after his service in the military, the way I did going through college. Because no, no one should start out life with a six-figure debt over their heads. They'll never become homeowners, and that is not good for our economy either. Okay, Senator, last question from your buddy, Mark Abristo. I have to ask her, well, she already won't let me vote early in her uh, location because it was moved somewhere else, but I don't think that's she's a fantastic person. Okay, it's a personal question. Can you say something about your problems with being served by the airline airport industry and why people with and without should care. Sure. So the airline industry um, treats medical devices like wheelchairs as luggage, not as medical devices. And I've had probably five different wheelchairs broken. When you break my wheelchair, when I get on an airplane and I transfer from my wheelchair into an airline seat, on the other end, my wheelchair needs to come up. If it doesn't come up in a way that I can use it, you've essentially taken my legs. You've taken a piece of my body away. And that is what we need to educate uh, the airlines on, that you need to treat this not like you just lost my extra pair of underwear, and I can just go to Walgreens very quickly and buy some. Yes, you can buy underwear at Walgreens. <laughs> when, you're in a, when you are stuck and you got, yeah. But, but you've taken my legs. I can't just go buy another, another wheelchair. And you have left people immobilized. People who lose their wheelchairs, who are fine, get their wheelchairs back, or any other medical device damage, can be immobilized in a bed until their wheelchair comes back because they're complex medical de devices. So what I did was I passed legislation that forces um, airlines to report how many wheelchairs they damage every day around the country. In the first month of reporting, which was December, and it was only three weeks, it was 700. 700. Um, and so I think that this is a, a consumer rights issue. If we could get to know what the on-time rate for a particular flight with a particular airline, we should know what the damage rate is for medical devices. I'm also working with the, um, with the airlines. American Airlines in particular has reached out to me um, and set up training programs for their luggage handlers and their contractors. Because a lot of what happens is they say, well, it's not our American Airlines employees, but it's the contracting company that's doing it. I said, well, it doesn't matter. You have to have someone who understands how to use and how to move and how to operate this equipment because it is not luggage. It is, my, it is literally the, my limbs that you are damaging, and that is not right. Okay, just, Sarah, thank you, Senator.